This is the Emmanuel Message Podcast. For more information on Emmanuel, check us out online at kenosha.church. We have all heard the phrase, fake it till you make it. But is it true? Today, Pastor Andy will discuss the consequences of faking the faith and how to live in the freedom of following Christ. Enjoy the message. Good morning, Emmanuel Kenosha Church. It is good to be together, to worship together, and to get into God's Word together. Am I right? You happy to be in church this morning? Yes, and as Tom said, it is awesome that we are able to stream live into everybody that's at home scattered across Kenosha, we can't wait to see you and you're ready to come back. Again, we've been saying we in this season, this hybrid season, we are one church in many locations, right here in the physical location here at Pershing and 60th, but then homes all across Lake County, Kenosha County and Racine County. So uh, we are just that we miss you. We're saving the seat for you. All right. Well, uh, you know, I, this is a big week, too, because I, I, I was like, something's missing in this room this week and it's all our kids, all right? And so Emmanuel Kids is running. It's their first week. And for those of you at home, like, oh no, what's this mean for online Emmanuel Kids? It's, hey, we're going to continue with that as well. But uh, it's been awesome to see the other half of our building open up for the first time today. And I remember seeing my kids coming in. They got temperature checks. You know, we're making sure it's all safe and, and we're ready to, ready to roll. And so, but in order for that to continue to be a reality each and every week is we want to make sure our family experience team or our host team out front, we have enough people to make sure that we wipe down everything and make sure this place is good for second service and make sure that people feel uh, hospitable. So if you consider Emmanuel your home, uh, this is your time now to step in. In fact, one of our core values here at Emmanuel is that we are just not spiritual consumers, but we are also to be contributors. And that's one great way for you to step in and really just make sure the kingdom of God uh, advances, but also to make sure that we can continue, continue to have church each and every week. And you know what? After not having a physical service in the month of end of March, April, May, and then some of June, I'm going to tell you, I do not take any Sunday for granted. Did God teach you that during, during, the, during the pandemic, not to take the gathering of, 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 of the saints uh, for granted? And so I don't want to do that. And we need to lean into that so we don't become easily forgetful because we are forgetful people. All right, we're going to continue in our series, Empires, Volume 1. Just as Tom said, it is a chapter by chapter, often verse by verse. Sometimes we get stuck on a word study of the book of Romans, a letter to the Roman Christians in the early church. And for us, this is going to push us from being uh, maybe surface level or just knowledge surface level or experience surface level Christians. And it's going to push us to be fully devoted followers of Christ. In fact, that's our mission statement here in Emmanuel, to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ who personally connect people to the power of God. This is what this book is going to be pushing us towards. And so we're going to start off uh, today, or we're going to continue rather, in Romans chapter 2, verse 17. We're going to pick up where Pastor Tom left off last week, Romans chapter 2, verse 17. And as you're turning there in your Bibles or your YouVersion Bible app, again, if you're our guest, we're happy you're here. The words will be on the screen for you. Um, as you're turning there, I just want to ask you this question. How many, and this is, this, is a, this is not a rhetorical question, this is a question I want you to participate in, all right? So how many of you have heard the phrase, fake it till you make it, right? How many of you have heard the phrase, right? Okay, so I'm assuming if your hand's not up, you've never heard that phrase before. Fake it till you make it, right? So keep your hands up high, all right? So if you've heard, if you've heard of this phrase, raise your hand up high, all right? Great. Now, keep it, keep it at raise, all right? Now, how many of you actually believe in that phrase? Fake it till you make it. It's okay, so you're like, ah, maybe a little bit. All right, you got some people that are bold with it. All right, that's, you know, wh where did this phrase come from? Fake it till you make it is a memorable expression uh, that basically says, act as if you got it even if you have no clue what you're doing, right? Act as if you got it, even if you have no clue what you're doing. Ignoring the, the self-doubt, uh, the I don't knows. It's going about it as if you are an expert. You know, unfortunately, this happened to me on my first day of being an intern pastor. All right, I was uh, in Iowa uh, years ago. It was my first morning and I was a little late arriving to church. Go figure, right? Uh, instead of 30 minutes early, I was 20 minutes early. And so when I arrived in the building, I noticed uh, the, the pastor of the church, his name is Pastor Joel. He's been there, he had been there for 36 years. I said, hey, Joel, how you doing? I was, I was expecting, you know, like, hey, Andy, it's your first Sunday. But no, he didn't even respond to me. He just looked at me. And you know, like when someone looks at you and it's like, like looking right through you, 
You know, like they, they're not here right now. All right. And, and I said, good morning, Joel. And he goes, where's Bob? I'm like, okay, who's Bob? I like, this is my first Sunday. I don't know who Bob is. Right. And there could be 15 different Bobs in here. I have no clue. And I was like, Joel, this is my first Sunday. I don't know who Bob is. Even if I saw him, I wouldn't know who he is. And he just said, Bob is our guest speaker for the morning and he isn't here. Andy, do you have a sermon? I need you to preach. Now, of course, I'm like, no, I don't have a sermon. Like, this is my first Sunday, and the only sermon I ever preached was in Bible school in a class. But you know what happens when you're thinking something, but your mouth outpaces your mind? That's what happened in this moment. And so what came out of my mouth was a three-letter word that I'm going to spell for you because I wish this never came out of my mouth. But I said, Y-E-S. Yes, I have a sermon. And he's like, great. What sermon do you have? And inside, I'm freaking out. I have a, my heart's racing. I probably had 150 beats per second. And I'm like, um, uh, per minute, per second, wow. Uh, but, uh, and I'm like, wow, I'm just, I'm, uh, what do I do? What do I do? He's like, oh, it's Psalm 34, because that's the sermon I preached in preaching class. I'm, I'm going to preach Psalm 34 this morning. And he looked like, he turned into like a ghost at this period. His, his, his face went completely just ghostly white. And he said, Andy, that's the sermon I preached last week. And I'm like, a sermon last week? He goes, you know what, Andy? We're just going to have to go, go for it. Yours is going to be an, a, you know, part two. Yours is going to be basically a response to my sermon. And I'm thinking, you've been preaching for 36 years. I've never been preaching ever. And you want me to come up and give you a part two on a sermon you gave last week? But you know what? I'm going to fake it till I make it. So I didn't say that I couldn't do it. I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I walked into the worship center. I walk up all bold to the AV guy. He, you know, he microphoned me up. And he's like, you're going to preach today? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to preach today. We're going to preach on Psalm 34. Oh, what's it going to be about? I don't know, but it's going to change your life, right? I mean, I showed the confidence. And when I went to sit down in the front row and start singing the worship songs, my mouth might have been mouthing the words of the worship song. But inside, I was trying to plea bargain with the Lord. I was like, Lord, if there is a moment where you can come back, I think this is the moment. I think this is when you're supposed to come back. They say you don't know the day or time. I think this is the time. And so I bargained with him. But by song number two, number three, he wasn't coming back. So I, I doubled down on the bargain. I said, Lord, you can just take me. Just, I don't know if that's rapture, he's knocking me out. Just take me, Lord. And by the end of the third song, it was apparent I was going to have to go up and preach extemporaneously from Psalm 34. And as I was getting ready to go up to the podium, I get this tap on my shoulder and I'm such in the zone that I thought it was the Holy Spirit. I was excited for a moment because I thought the Holy Spirit was gonna download his knowledge into me that morning and I was gonna give a knockdown sermon, but it wasn't. It was some man with a giant Bible. And I said, who are you? He goes, I'm Bob. I've come to preach this morning. Can I have the microphone? And I'm like, yes, you can have the microphone. And Bob, when he went up and he preached a, a fiery sermon, but to, if I can be completely honest with you, I have no idea what he was saying, but I can tell you what, the, I can tell you what I got out of the message that, this morning. I, I can't remember anything, but I can tell you what I got out of it. You ready for this? This is what I learned and I'll never forget it. Fake it till you make it is terrible advice. It's terrible advice. If you live by it, it's gonna bite you eventually. Now listen, it, this shouldn't be confused with, you know, you know, you know, try, try again. If first you don't succeed, try, try again. That's pretty good advice, right? Uh, this shouldn't be confused with being hungry and learning and, and, and learning even if you don't know exactly what you're doing. This isn't, I, I would encourage you to jump into the deep end and learn how to swim. Just don't drown, learn how to swim. Make sure there's a swim instructor there. But when you say you're gonna fake it till you make it, that's like jumping into the deep end, right? Not knowing how to swim, but you tell everybody you're an Olympic diver. So fake it till you make it. I'm going to tell you, it's not good advice, but we've all done it. We may have done it this morning. Where do you fake it to look like you've made it? You know, I was at a camp once and there's this guy teaching archery and it seemed a little off. And I said, Hey, how'd you get the gig in teaching archery? And he's like, I just showed the camp. I was confident. I didn't know a thing about archery. He's like, really? He's like, yep. And, and you're teaching it? Yep, because I had the confidence, right? Where do we show confidence 
where we should have no confidence? Where, where do we show confidence or where do we, we try to, to, to show that we are awesome at something? Our outer persona isn't meeting our inner persona. You know, perhaps you're fooling people this morning. You're trying to make yourself look like you have the perfect marriage or the perfect relationship or the perfect kids or the perfect job. Uh, you know, spiritually speaking, as Christians, we have a tendency to make sure that people think that we have it all together spiritually. So where are we faking it till we make it? Where is our public persona calculated? You know, why do we do it? Well, we do it because we are filled often with self-doubt or maybe we want the security of fitting in or, you know, we want to be liked by others. We want to look like we're competent. You know, in today's text, though, we are going to look at why faking it is not a good idea. In fact, it could just, be, it, could, it could really mess things up in our life, but also the people that are looking into our life. In fact, uh, in Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 24, he says, For as it is written, the name of God is blaspheming among the Gentiles because of you. (laughs) How would you like the Apostle Paul to come up to you and say, you know what, Uh, all the people that don't believe in God, like they are like cursing God this morning because they're looking at your life. So when we fake it, specifically in our spiritual life, it can have grave consequences specifically to those that don't know Christ. And you know, there's a big push in the church today to be authentic. We've heard this, right? Just be real, be authentic. I like that person, he's authentic. Listen, you should be authentic, you should be real, right? That, that, that's a good thing, right? In fact, um, it's one of our favorite core values here. I say it probably every other week, so maybe you're sick of it, but the reason why I say it is because we, we naturally fall into faking it, so I want us to, to check that, and so here's the core value, you can say it with me. We're not perfect people, but we are people being Right, somebody like made no. Listen, listen, we listen. We forget that. Guess what? We'll live fake, right? And so we want to be made new. But listen, here's the problem with what I hear about when people say, "I just love the authenticity of that person." You see, I'm not saying don't be authentic or don't be real, but too often people want to be real about the struggles, but it turns into some form of celebration of the struggle instead of the pursuit to overcome that struggle. So let's be real so that we can find the freedom that we are to have in Christ to overcome that struggle. So here's the main idea, and we're gonna jump right into the text. The main idea this morning is this. It's not about faking, but following. It's not about faking, but following. The context of uh, the book of Romans, where we've been at this far, of Romans, again, is the most beautiful, rich expression of the gospel. It is some of the most direct commands of how to receive a relationship with Christ, how to be in a personal relationship with the living God. Paul begins this beautiful letter, though, with hitting us over the head with a two-by-four, right? Some of you that are brand new to Emmanuel will be like, man, I've just been getting hit over the head hard, uh, you know, just over this issue of sin, and here's the deal. Uh, If we don't know our sinfulness, of our depravity, we won't know the depths of his love and grace he has for us. So Paul begins this beautiful letter in chapters one and two on the brokenness of the human condition of our sin. These chapters are easy to avoid because to focus on our brokenness, it can be a downer, all right? But to understand the universality of our sin problem makes us understand the urgency of the remedy. And so he begins in chapter one, Paul indicts the immoral, irreligious person. So that's his first focus is in chapter one on the immoral, irreligious. And this is what he said, uh, to highlight that in Romans 1.18, he said, for the God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their own unrighteousness suppress the truth. So he's speaking to those uh, that are uh, irreligious, immoral, they're creating their own morality. We see this often in culture today. But he then turns his attention in the second portion of a chapter, or the first portion of chapter two, to the religious moral person. Romans 2, 3 says, do you think any one of you who judges those who do such things, yet do the same that you will escape God's judgment? So what Paul is making clear in chapter one and chapter two is that every single person is guilty of sin. Every single person needs a savior. We are real, we've, we've dug a hole and we've jumped right into it. But this morning, he's going to zero in even further. He's going to name the most religious group you can think of. It is the chosen people of God, the Jewish people, who he later says in Romans 9, 4, the Israelites, to them belong adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple services, and the promises. 
Jewish people are entrusted with the law of God. He's, he's talking to the people of the book, but there's a problem. Now, for every single one of us that would consider ourselves Christ followers today, if you consider yourself somebody that knows Christ personally, you should be on the edge of your seat. Because these were the most religious people, according to man. Uh, these, these were God's chosen people, the people of the book. And listen, today, the equivalent of that would be followers of Christ. People say they're Christians. Are we people of the book, right? People of the book, maybe you, you attend church, maybe, maybe you, you know theological terms. In fact, the Bible calls Christ's followers today a new spiritual Israel. So even though Israel was God's chosen people, guess what? Followers of Christ, you are God's chosen people. Peter lays this out very clearly in 1 Peter 2.9. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. So if the Jewish people were chosen by God and now Christ's followers are chosen by God, what is the problem Paul's gonna address today? We've already talked about it just a little bit. Being fake. Being fake. It's not about faking. It's about following. I want to look at three consequences now of when we choose fake. Now, listen, we, we've theologically unpacked these last few weeks of why we need to be real with our faith. But what happens when we still choose to be fake? We're going to look at three consequences. The first one is this. You are quick to teach but slow to follow. You're quick to teach, but slow to follow. Let's pick up at verse 17. Now, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are superior, be instructed from the law, and if you're convinced that you're a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the arrogant, a teacher of the immature, having the embodiment of knowledge and truth in the law. Here it is, verse 21. You then, you teach another, don't you teach yourself? To the top of verse 17. Let's unpack this. Top of verse 17. We notice that he names the most specific group. He's been, he named the irreligious, the religious, now to the Jew. The name Jew was given specifically to the people who returned uh, to, to Judea. That's the southern part of Israel. They returned to Judea after the exile. Later, this name was extended to anybody with Hebrew descent. So the Jewish people were given the promised land of God, the land of Israel, to make much of the name and glory of God. But as they inherited the promised land of which we see in the Old Testament, it did not take long before the people of Israel began to practice religious practices, pagan practices from nations that surrounded them. And so very quickly they fell into idolatry, just gross idolatry. Uh, many of it was sexual idolatry. Uh, they, they began to practice the ideologies and the ethics of the pagan nations around them. And God would warn Israel time and time again. His fuse was long. Time and time again he would warn them that you need to return, you need to repent, or else you will, you will fall. And that's indeed what happened. The northern kingdom fell in 722 when the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. In 568, the southern kingdom fell uh, and the people of Israel went into exile only to later return to Jerusalem. And when they returned to Jerusalem, it was under Roman occupation. So when you read the Gospels uh, in the time of Jesus, uh, even though the Jewish people had Jerusalem and they had a place to live, it, they were being occupied by Rome. And so many during the times of Jesus, they anticipated a Messiah would come to rescue the nation of Israel politically. And so when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, a lot of people had the wrong idea what Jesus came for, and they were disappointed. You know what? You know what I'm seeing in today's culture? People are twisting the words of Jesus, and they have the wrong idea why Jesus came, and they make it into some kind of ideological, political, some kind of national thing. What I want to tell you this right now is that Jesus came because we're in a heap of sin trouble without him. We have no remedy without him. This is why he came, to seek and save the lost. Those are the very words of Jesus. They're not up for debate. But yet many people, as today, many people in Jesus' day were, were disappointed, to say the least, rejected Jesus. They crucified him. Uh, they, were, they were down when he was crucified. And many people viewed Jesus as a failed political hero. 
And so, after Jesus, for the next 2,000 years, there was no nation of Israel on the map. You couldn't find it on the map. And this confused people, whether it be, uh, whether it be uh, the Jewish people or whether it be Christians. Because when we look in the book of Revelation, guess what we see all over the place? When the world ends, the book of Revelation hasn't happened yet, all right? At the end of the world, what do we see? We see the nation of Israel. So for, for 2,000, almost 2,000 years, people were just confused. Like, when is Israel coming back? When is Israel coming back? Well, then, only to reappear, Israel appeared again on May the 14th, 1948. And again, I want you to know that 1948 seems like a long time ago, but I want you to think of this. Israel fell in 568 BC, and it didn't come back until 1948 AD, which means there may be people in this room that were alive when Israel came back. Israel takes an important role as we get close to the second coming of Christ. And this is, why, uh, this is why for both Jewish people and Christians, we have particular interest with Israel. So to have a Jewish label was of high honor in the religious world. Uh, and today, uh, even in the Christian world, you, could, you might feel like you have high honor. Uh, but what Paul wants to make clear is it's easy to hide behind a label. It's easy to hide behind an identity without living out the implications of that identity. You see, in the first century, there were teachers of the law, and, and, and you know, they were the most honored people of society. But the problem was this. They were eager to teach. They were eager to teach the blind. But verse 21, we see here, there's a clear problem. You then who teach another, don't you teach yourself? Now, this isn't a legitimate question. He's not saying, hey, I just want to make sure, you know, heart check here. Um, I just want to make sure if you're teaching everybody that you're just, you know, practicing what you preach. I just want to make sure, okay. No, he's saying, he is, he's implying an answer. Hey, you're, you're teaching all this stuff? Guess what? Why aren't you practicing it in your life? Why are you faking it? Why are you doing, you're telling people to do as you say, not as you do. Why? There's a gap between who they say they were and who they really were. For the Jewish person hiding behind their national ID, their, their knowledge, it, it served as a security blanket for them. For Christians, it, this, this could be that maybe you placed your faith and trust in Christ or you ask Jesus into your heart when you're young. And listen, you can do that. And then many kids have, have done that here at Emmanuel. That, that's an amazing thing. But people will say, you know, I just, I, I asked Jesus into my heart or, or, you know, I downloaded the Bible app and I have it on my, my phone and I read it every once in a while. Or I, I took communion or I went to catechism or I, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. And sometimes we hide behind those things without really questioning, did we place our faith and trust in Jesus? Did we make this relationship personal or is it all up here? Did it travel from the head to the heart? You see, when we hide behind an identity at the expense of living out this identity, we can feel secure, but there's not much change. It's kind of like this. When I grew up, my dad had a security sign out front of our house. He loved that security sign. I'm going to tell you this right now. He told me not to tell anybody. But I think it's, you know, it's been a long time ago. We didn't own a security system. Right? He, he found the sign and he put that right outside to just make sure that no robber was going to come in and steal anything. Listen, here's the deal. That sign wasn't stopping anybody, but it made him sleep just a little bit better at night. Well, guess what? Whenever we hide behind an identity without living out that identity, whenever we hide behind something that's not Christ and him crucified, that's like putting out that security sign in front of our house and we go to bed thinking we're a little bit safer, even though we're not. This is often why people hide behind not living their identity in Christ. They want to feel secure, but you know what they do? A person that is faking it till they make it, they want to become a teacher, and they want to become a teacher quick. They want to be a guide to the blind, as Paul says. They want to, you know, listen, here's the deal. Teaching is not a bad thing. Teaching in itself the things of God is not a bad thing. Without teaching, we don't know how to enter a personal relationship with Christ. We don't know how uh, to become a fully devoted follower of Christ. We don't know how to live out his will in our life. The revelation of God, that is the, the Bible, guides our experience. It is the final authority for our experience. If you have a light to shine, we are told to shine that light. Teaching is not a bad thing. So what's the problem? They weren't eating what they were cooking. We were warned later in the, in the book of James, James 3, 1, it says, not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. James warns us not to be too eager to become teachers because the spotlight that you're placing on others will come back on you, and when the spotlight comes back on you, what will they find? So let's be clear again. To be a teacher is a good thing. 
But a good teacher never ceases to be a good student of the scriptures. They are humble and they have hustle for the things of God. So Paul warns us that when we fake it, we will try to teach others and we wanna be a teacher quickly. But it's not about faking it, it's about following. When, when you are subscribed to fake, you will, you're gonna be quick to teach, but slow to follow. Secondly, there'll be little to no life change. There'll be little to no life change. Verse 21, you who preach, you must not steal. Do you steal? You say you must not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blaspheming among the Gentiles because of you. You see, Paul is speaking to the hypocrisy of many of these teachers that they would preach one thing and yet do another. And so Paul asks three questions. He's like, hmm, should I go through the 10 commandments? Why don't I just go through three? I bet I can get them on three. Number one is, do you steal? Well, of course, everybody would know from the 10 commandments, don't steal. I mean, if you're not a Christ follower today, I mean, I, I, I think even a Satanist would know not to steal, right? Like, not, do not steal is a universal ethic. And so he's asking, hey, you guys steal? And I can just see what they're saying. Pfft, of course we don't steal. We're teachers, come on. Like, well, we know the law, come on. He's like, okay. Yet, what was common in this day was they might not just completely thieve things, but they may overcharge. Uh, they, they, they may take interest or, they, or their scales may be off when they're, when they're doing things, uh, practice uh, their business in the marketplace. It was very common for people to be shady in their transactions. So he asked, do you steal? He's thinking, yes, you do. Secondly, do you commit adultery? And they're like, I can't believe you're asking me that. Committing adultery, of course not. But he's just borrowing what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28. Jesus said, but I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What he's saying is, okay, teachers, you may be committed to your spouse or, or, or you may be unmarried or whatever, but listen, I caught you window shopping in the market. And guess what Jesus said? Adultery. Then he goes on to one more thing. The thing that they would never do. He mentions do you rob temples? Now here's what they're thinking, Pfft, robbing temples. Are you kidding? Our grandparents fell into idolatry. We went into exile. There is no way we are going to go into idol temples and steal those idols. And you know what? They were right. In Jesus's day, uh, the, the Jewish people, the, the Pharisees, you would never worship down on an idol. The I idolatry was down to a like, chiseled idol was pretty much eradicated. But he's not asking the physical question. He's asking what's going on in the heart. And this is what would happen as often they would rob from their own temples. How? Tithes and offerings. In fact, Josephus, a great historian of Jesus' day, wrote that this was so awful that sometimes they would set up an offering bucket and they would entice rich people to give large sums of money, but it would never end up in the church. Hmm, I think that's called stealing too, right? But the thing is, it's like they're, they're so happy that they've gotten away from idolatry. They're not robbing idol, idols from other temples. But he's like, okay, you're being nice to them, but why are you robbing your own temple? They taught, but it wasn't caught. They wanted to do as they wanted you to do as they said, but not as they did. The Jewish people were dumbfounded. I'm just, I, I, I just imagining them hearing Paul. I'm like, oh, I can't believe this. Okay, you know, of course we want to be teachers. What are you saying that there's not a lot of fruit in our life? You know what? They, I, I can imagine they're just kind of huddling. Okay, guys, it's time to pull out the trump card. It's time to pull out the biggest thing we have. And he won't have anything to answer for this. Their trump card? <clears throat> this is to you and I going to seem a little personal and a little weird. Their trump card was circumcision. Verse 25. Circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But if you're a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So... If an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Verse 27. A man who is physically uncircumcised but keeps a law will judge you, will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. Now, this kind of took an unexpected turn. 
If people are going to start boasting about stuff, are they really going to start boasting about their circumcision? Circumcision was an outward sign of the Jewish covenant. Newborn boys and later converted men would get circumcised, which is a surgical procedure. Uh, you know what? I'm going to stop there. If you don't know what this is, just, just nudge the person next to you and just say, what is he talking about? All right, just ask your parents, all right? Just, and if, if, if you're grown people, give your parents a call today. Like, oh, I'm so happy that you called today. He's like, I got a question, all right? <laughs> Circumcision was practiced for cleanliness, but it was also an outward sign to show their devotion and their commitment to the Lord. And so it was an important sign in, in marriage, but it was also an important sign because many pagan religions, the way they practiced their pagan religion is that you would go to a prostitute. So could you imagine a Jewish man going to a pagan temple and going to see a prostitute? Could you see that? They'd be like, they'd be outed immediately. And so this was an outward sign to show that, they, that not only are we different, but there is a different sexual ethic for the people of God. Over time, the sign of circumcision was used as an outward reason why the Jewish men were thinking they're right with God. Well, I've, are, you, are you right with the Lord? Are you saved? I've been circumcised. Oh, great, great, you're saved, you're saved. But listen, if one needs to personally place their faith in Jesus, this issue, which I don't think we're debating this issue today, or any issue, cannot be added to what he did on the cross. In our day, we can replace circumcision, the argument with that, with claims that you're, you've been a good person or you've been baptized. Oh, you know, I've taken communion or I've gone through this class or this program. I have the trophy to prove it. But listen, it's the cross of Christ. It's his faith plus grace plus nothing. Verse 28, for a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly and the true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart by the spirit, not the letter. That person's praise is not from the people, but from God. What we see here is something very key is that Paul is again defining a, a true Jewish person uh, as one who has been changed in the heart. We, we notice that as followers of Christ, uh, we, we are now being grafted in to the nation of Israel and, and Israel will be grafted in towards the latter days is what we'll learn later on in Romans. But listen, as Christians, you need to understand this if you consider yourself a Christ follower, is that we cannot hide behind our experience. We gotta understand the person who we worship in the experience. Tim Keller said it this way, it's possible to trust in Christianity rather than Christ. And this can happen in conservative evangelical churches. Paul is showing us a condition called dead orthodoxy, where the basic doctrines of the Bible are accurately subscribed to but do not make any internal difference. There is an intellectual grasp of the gospel, but no internal revolution. It's not about baking. It's about following. When you place your faith and trust in Christ, you receive his grace freely. There's nothing that you can do to merit or earn his salvation. There's nothing. However, when you meet Jesus, when you place your faith and trust in him alone, you are given what the Bible says is the Holy Spirit. You're given a new identity. You go from sinner to saint. Uh, you, you are, you're considered a son and daughter of the king, which means this. There is a change happening inside of you. It's not instantaneous. It's a lifelong change. But when someone says, I'm going to act however I want to act, and there's never a change, the Bible says you need to examine yourself to make sure that you are in the faith. Now, don't get this mixed up. I'm not saying do these things so that you're in the faith. But if you're in the faith, your heart is going to change to want to do the things of the faith. So the question I have for us this morning is this. Where have we been playing where do we need to follow? So let's take our three points this morning and flip them into action steps. Number one is this. Where are you quick to preach and slow to follow? Where are you quick to preach and slow to follow? Where are you quick to teach? Secondly, what fruits of the Spirit are lacking? What fruits are you growing and lacking? So let's specifically look at what's going well, what's not. And where you're thriving, thank God. Thank God for where you're thriving. He is the one that produces fruit in you through, through your obedience. But where you're not thriving, 
You need to go to God this morning. Number one, it may be asking forgiveness, but secondly, asking for his help. He's so kind and wants to meet you in the area that you're struggling. And third, where do you tend to add to the gospel? What are you tempted to add to the gospel? Do you believe that Christ is enough? Are you placing your full faith and trust at what he did on the cross for you as sufficient for forgiveness of your sins? Do you believe that he rose from the dead? Or do you believe that he died on the cross, but you also place weight on your baptism or on your taking communion or church attendance? Listen, those things are good things, but they have nothing to do with your salvation and everything to do with your obedience that grows out of your salvation. So what are you tempted to add to the gospel? And this is an important question. This isn't just a theoretical, theological question. The thing is this, when we add to the gospel, we take away living in his grace and we become works-based in trying to gain God's approval in our life. We always think he's mad at us. We always think that our salvation is dependent upon us and what we, how well we live life and do things. But salvation is a gift and a gift alone, which means this. It doesn't matter what's gone on in your background. It doesn't matter what you come to or where you come from today. It means when you receive Christ as your savior, he is mighty to save. When you place your faith and trust in him alone, he's able to forgive each and every one of your sins. And he places you on a completely different trajectory. It's called being a Christ follower, following and trusting him as a response of the beautiful thing that he did for you. Without him, we are lost. Without him, there is a chasm so deep that we would never stop falling. This chasm, the depth of this chasm shows the heights of his love that he has for us. I'm gonna pray. We're gonna ask God to meet us in these three questions. And so if you consider yourself a Christ follower, I want you to, I want you to act, let the spirit search your heart. Where are you quick to preach, but slow to follow? What fruit is growing, what's not? Where are you adding to his grace? Today, if you are uncertain that you're a Christ follower, I wanna give you the opportunity of making certain that you're right with God. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just pray that you would meet us now. Thank you for showing us very vividly the ramifications if we choose to live an unauthentic, fake life in you. God, I pray that you would make us real, that we would, that we would uh, be wholehearted in our following of you. But God, I wanna pray specifically for the person that they're uncertain if they're right with you. They're uncertain if they're going to heaven. They're uncertain if their sins have been forgiven. God, I pray that you would open up their hearts right now. In fact, as we continue to pray, I wanna to speak to that person or persons in this room or online. And I, I just wanna to speak to you. Today, if you were to meet God, would you be certain that you'd be going to heaven? Would you be certain? You see, if you're basing your, your assurance, if you're basing uh, your trust that you're gonna to go to heaven because of something you did, I'm gonna tell you right now, you're on very shaky ground. You see, God created you to have a relationship with him, but our sins, they separated us from God. And there's nothing that we can do. The Bible is from the cover to cover shows us there is nothing that we can do to bridge that chasm that stands before God and us. That's why God, full of love and mercy, came to be among us. Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God, came to this earth to die in our place to take the punishment of sin. You see, for the wages, the result of sin is death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. He went to the cross. He died for every one of our sins, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He rose from the dead three days later because he was a perfect, sinless sacrifice. And the Bible makes it very clear. When you believe, you receive. When you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. So who here today knows they need to receive Jesus or they're uncertain where they stand with Jesus and they wanna make certain of that today? 
If that's you, with every head's bowed and eyes closed, if you're like, that's me, I, I need to make certain or I know I need Jesus in my life today. I feel far from him. I'm uncertain where I am with him. But today I want Jesus to step into my life. I want to place my faith and trust in him alone. I want him to forgive my sins. Every head bowed and eyes closed. If that's you, just raise your hand and say, yep, that's me. I want to place my faith. I want to place my trust in Christ alone. And if you're online, just respond with that hand down at the bottom or let one of our moderators know. And just let them know that today you want to place your faith and trust in Jesus. In fact, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to, we're going to pray together. We're going to help those that maybe have not prayed to God in years. We're going to pray together because today I believe all across this area, people are saying yes to Jesus. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. I realize I've done wrong in my life and I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross, raising from the dead. Place my faith and trust in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to pray, if you consider yourself a Christ follower, I ask you to let the Holy Spirit just search you in those three questions. Where are you quick to teach but slow to follow? Where, what fruits are lacking? Galatians 2.20 is a, is a great spot to, to, uh, to look there. Where fruits are lacking. For some of you, it's gonna start with a phrase that's been going through my head a lot right now is, I'm sorry. That I'm sorry is reserved for somebody in your life. That unresolved conflict has eaten away at your fruitfulness. Who is that? Just think about that. If that doesn't apply to your life, that, that's cool. But I do believe that is somewhere in this room this morning. For some of you, You speak anxiety more than you pray it up to heaven. If that's you, God stands ready to take all your anxieties, cast all anxieties on him because he cares for you. For those of you that feel that you're never good enough, you know what? We're never good enough. You know who is? Christ is. And so we can give up trying to live that perfect life and trying to add to that gospel. Where do you, there's people today, you, 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 are, you, you are our follower of Christ, but man, you just struggle with that grace. You struggle for God forgiving you for that thing that happened in the past. He's forgiven you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Again, if you'd like more information on Emmanuel, check us out online at kenosha.church. Also, we'd love it if you connected with us on Facebook and Instagram, both at kenosha.church. Lastly, if you enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe to us on iTunes at Emmanuel Kenosha. That way you never have to miss an episode and it helps us out greatly. At Emmanuel, we are not a perfect people, but a people being made new. Thanks for listening to this week's episode and we'll see you next time on the Emmanuel Message Podcast.